Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I can see there are lots of people online um, and a few people there in person. Um, so firstly, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Carly Redhead here on behalf of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And welcome to our presentation on citizen-generated data for COVID-19 response. Today, you're going to hear directly from local organizations about how OpenMap data supported response efforts as well as how we can incorporate open data in microplanning for vaccine equity. I'm joined today by Paula Araujo, Global Active Learning School in Peru, Erin Escott, Samia Suren from Public Lab Mongolia, and Carter Draper, representing iLab Liberia, Megan Danielson from Mapbox, and Matt Berg from ONA. So this week at UN World Data Forum, we've been repeatedly hearing the phrase, leave no one behind. But without accurate maps of where people live, we can't actually achieve this. So why have we selected this panel that's here today? Well, each of these speakers represents a part of the global open mapping movement and is making a significant contribution to closing the maps gap and being able to use that data for decision making. From leading on local efforts, supporting local residents and groups to ensure their needs are heard and that they can engage in creating map data, to private sector organizations that leverage this data to analyze access to immunization services. So first, what is one thing that we all have in common? If we can move on to the next slide, please. So we're all working together um, to build a free and open map of the world using OpenStreetMap, like the map that you can see in the background here. Um, and most of you are familiar with this already, if you've, if you've heard of us and that's why you've turned up. But for those of you who are not, it's like the Wikipedia of maps. It's a public good so that valuable data can be used by all local actors. That means that all data on OpenStreetMap is free and open to access, open to use, download, incorporate in offline analysis, applications, etc. Now, I work with Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, or HOT, and we're an international team dedicated to humanitarian action. By combining OpenStreetMap data with open source tools and local knowledge, we support mapping communities worldwide, and we create and provide open data and maps that contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. Many of you, many of you already know that maps are critical in the hours, the days, and the weeks after a disaster. We've worked on disaster response, as well as projects in public health, in climate change, in gender equality, and also in preparedness too. So what about when the COVID-19 pandemic started? One billion people were living in, if we can move to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, so one, million, one billion people were living in completely or partially unmapped communities, and they risked being left out of life-saving programs and unable to access healthcare and other services. We had a problem of missing maps and a lack of availability of data. COVID-19 disproportionately affected communities in low middle income countries. And while the virus itself does not discriminate, the inequality and response efforts have highlighted the disparities across the globe in so many ways, from inequitable vaccine access to higher mortality rates in certain areas due to lack of adequate services. Now, these response efforts are heavily dependent on testing, on contact tracing, on identifying vulnerable population groups, knowing where key facilities are and where to distribute vaccines. Where there's limited information on people, their location, their situation and their needs, it's really difficult to ascertain the full magnitude of the pandemic and to reach them with response efforts. And this information is super critical um, to the successful and equitable response efforts. So the problem we have is that without a local map, it's really incredib incredibly difficult to gather this information. Now, this past week um, at the UN World Data Forum, we keep saying, leave no one behind. That's exactly what we're looking to do here. We want to leave no one behind in the creation of a map that's with and for people to help so solve challenges that they experience. When we say citizen-generated data, we mean local map data that's created by citizens. This data can then be used to support formal data users, such as national statistical offices. When we hear leave no one behind, we recognize this is a data justice problem. 
many communities were and are still at risk of being left behind to essential services and access and access to vaccines due to not being visible on the map. So what did we do in response to this problem? Well, HOT, together with the community and partners around the world, coordinated the most extensive disaster mapping activation in its history. We used the same global network of dedicated contributors, of tools, of data collection methods to collect OpenStreetMap data, as we have done with other problems previously. We focused on helping responders to identify where vulnerable populations were located, to identify missing data on health infrastructure, and also funding support. We funded seven rapid response microgrants in places that were most at risk. 26,000 individuals came together and made micro con contributions to this macro COVID-19 pandemic. They added 4.8 million missing features to OpenStreetMap. And this data created by citizen mappers in OpenStreetMap was directly used in logistics planning and routing analysis. It supported the needs of organizations such as the Red Cross, UN OCHA, World Bank, and many more local organizations. So let's hear what happened directly from those leading on locally driven response efforts. I'm now going to hand over to Carter Draper, who's the board president of iLab Liberia, who can share what this group in Liberia did to map all functional healthcare and COVID-19 facilities so that people could locate services. Over to you, Carter. open your mic sorry carter can you start again for us all right so again carter draper a board director at alab liberia so the first covid 19 case was confirmed in march 2020 in liberia liberia like several other countries in the region did not have the systems and infrastructure to control the, the spread of the virus However, this part of the efforts on the part of the government uh, to contain the virus, the spread continues. Meanwhile, relevant information to citizens were quite limited and the gap around COVID-19 awareness, um, basic information on prevalence of cases, uh, testing centers, quarantine centers, and the rest of that inf relevant information were lacking. ILAB Liberia, as a local non for profit technology hub, saw the need for the knowledge of on healthcare and that of the needed infrastructure uh, for citizens, for researchers, and for respondents to access in order to mitigate uh, the situation. Liaised with the humanitarian Open Street team through a rapid response grant, and that grant enabled ILAB to map all functional health facilities across the country including COVID-19 facilities, as well as COVID cases that were kind of spotting out across different parts of the country. All of that data was placed onto the open street map. This project lasted for three months and everything was done extensively online and remotely. So we have volunteers working from home and throughout that project, we were able to map up to 24 hospitals, 750 clinics, over 20 healthcare facilities, that were mapped both on the open street map as well as on other digital platforms. Beyond the mapping of the facility on open street map, we also printed out as a way of offline access. We printed out over 20 uh, maps of the data that we, we created and we were able to share the maps with healthcare centers across a different country to help in their logistics planning and reference uh, for other response. The map data informed the government local NGOs and communities uh, to locate health facilities, to identify where to get tested and quarantined. Um, and the additional data that we provided through this macro grant was, vital, was a vital component to laborious awareness and our prevention of the Ebola of the, camp, uh, the coronavirus. As we speak to date, we have since September 28, 20, since September 28th, we have in country less than 20 cases of COVID-19. How did we do this? We walked through key stakeholders, 
the National Public Health Institute of Liberia was quite helpful in giving or providing us with sit reps, daily sit reps of the number of cases uh, in different categories. We work with the Ministry of Health that provided us with uh, data sets of health existing um, and non-functional health facilities which we had to claim. We work with the public Ministry of Public Works which provided us with rural network data sets that were used to map, to create relevant maps to show how logistics could move around easily to those health facilities that could not otherwise be reached easily. We liaise with the Library Institute of Statistics and Information Services, uh, who provided us with um, boundary maps of clans, districts, county levels, and all of that that we're able to use to develop the different map layers uh, for the printed maps. County health teams and the international organizations were also part of those institutions that um, are adequately and effectively using that data, including researchers, universities, students, and the general public. Next slide, please. How did we do all of this in a period where there was a lockdown and everyone working from home? So we were able to effectively engage stakeholders, largely remotely, but partly in person, uh, taking into consideration all of the COVID-19 um, regulations at the time. We received data sets from different stakeholders that we were able to assess and make sense of uh, to know what was quite more relevant to be able to present to the general public for better response. Out of that data set, we were able to develop data model that we used to be able to develop different layers of data sets that uh, we could use into maps, both onto OSM, um, the Open Street Map, of course, but as well as other digital maps. We conducted remote training with our contributors, with some contributors that work on the project. We also conducted remote mapping for a larger community of uh, OSM users and those that are interested in uh, mapping communities and contributing to bringing communities alive onto the map. We were able to claim the huge data sets that were given us using different spreadsheets and all of that. At the end of the data processing, we were able to publish the data on OpenStreetMap uh, as well as develop digital maps uh, created infographics and all of that out of that data sets. And beyond that, one of the key components was to create a awareness of which in fact this whole engagement or uh, support was all about. So we had to create engagement of uh, awareness of the contents that were developed through social media campaigns, through emails, through uh, newsletters, uh, to different institutions and networks that ILAP Labrador has an organization is part of, as well as the government institution. Next slide, please. Tools used. So we use laptops because we're working all remotely uh, from different homes. We had to use internet extensively. Uh, imagine this part of our world where internet keeps fluctuating. Uh, it was a challenge, but it was uh, for the greater good of the nation. And so uh, all of our volunteers were able to um, immensely contribute in whatever way or whatever uh, compensation that was provided for internet. We used a hot tasking manager, which enabled us to develop different tasks for the remote mapping activities across the different 15 counties of the country. We used GeoJosom, which is an editing tool uh, used in the OSM community for editing maps and contributing, of uh, adding data to maps, uh, using it for both remote mapping as well as validation of the data being added. We used the open area map to collect images, existing images um, that, we could, that were used for the remote mapping activity. We used QJs to develop the printed maps that we distributed across our different districts um, across the 15 counties in Liberia. Of course, then we used Google spreadsheets as we are receiving most of the data sets were actually in spreadsheet formats. So we had to now um, um, clean those data sets and liberate them into different uh, open source um, file formats. Next slide, please. The data sets included CSV, GeoJSON, uh, Shapefiles, and raw data sets. What we did on our website was we ensured that these data were not only clean and mapped, but that we also ensured that the data sets were in open formats and that we added them onto the website that anyone could download, repurpose, and then kind of uh, design new decisions and interventions using uh, the data that was made available. Uh, for the products, we, of course, the 15 counties, we developed printed maps. Why? Because uh, beyond you know, specific areas in the country, a lot of larger portion of the country is without internet connectivity. 
as such in order for this um, awareness and data and information to be able to reach across the entire country. We had to also include an offline component of our uh, engagement by creating printed maps with all of the different layers of the data that we collected and we distributed the maps across the country. Um, and, and the data sets we created, of course, as I said, were in different formats and we're able to not only add them to our site, but with all of the different stakeholders that we have as data users, we also email them um, all of these different files that they are now using the app now is now contributing to pretty much eradication or uh, a reduction in the number of cases across the country. We also kind of design infographics, uh, interactive infographics, so that when people visit uh, the online sites beyond the maps, they could be able to just click and interact with the data to make better sense of what was going on in the country and at each region within the country um, in different places. Great, in part. So as a result of that macro grant and the intervention from ILAB Liberia to support national government of local communities and NGOs around uh, the COVID-19 situation, we were able to map 24 functional health facilities, 750 clinics, uh, 20 health centers across the country. But then we were able to, info, we were able to uh, visualize 1,305 confirmed cases by August 2020. And then by January, uh, we kept updating that information. And it's, at that point in time, it was at 1,936 uh, by January. As we speak right now, since September of 2018, 2021, the total number of cases in Labrador are less than 20 to our nation. So we were able to map schools, hotels, sports stadiums, resource facilities, citizens and citizens were able to use these different uh, data sets. Why were we mapping these places? Because the government did not have adequate infrastructure. So they just kind of created like remote spots for testing, um, quarantine and all of that. So they were using hospitals, they were using public schools, they were using sports stadiums and all of that. And we were able to, through the macro grant and the support from other partners and our community, we were able to visualize, map all of that data and present that data to um, the citizens of Liberia, which we believe contributed significantly to the reduction in the number of cases. And we hope that that data will remain alive and will be more relevant even after this COVID-19 period. Next. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carter. We're now going to move to um, Eden Escott in Mongolia. So when lockdown came in in Mongolia, nomadic communities could not move, which meant that some districts were more overwhelmed than they would have been originally due to an influx of nomadic peoples. So let's hear from Eden Escott, the executive director of Public Lab Mongolia, on how they mapped all 21 provinces. Um, over to you, Eden Escott. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Edwin Sak, and uh, I work at uh, Public Lab Mongolia, and uh, we aim to support uh, resilient communities to open data. Here is, uh, you, uh, you can see the uh, uh, three different uh, pictures, and uh, it's uh, what life looks like in Mongolia. And the first picture is in downtown in city area and uh, semi-urban and uh, rural area. A total population uh, uh, is about the 3.2 million uh, million, and uh, half live in, in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar, and uh, most live in a nomadic uh, rural area. And the average income of uh, 500 uh, USD a month, and the issues include uh, access to public health and poor governance. Uh, some of these uh, places are where over 800,000 people live in no heating and uh, running water or sewage in, in, in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. And uh, the relationship between uh, government and the NGO is still developing. The problem we faced was uh, some vacations are uh, not existing on the map. And uh, this means uh, COVID response is very difficult to coordinate and uh, because of the lockdown, the nomadic communities could not move, which means some districts were uh, more overwhelmed than they would have been originally due to an influx of uh, uh, nomadic people. 
and uh, this is uh, yeah. And uh, what we did to uh, we built to a network of uh, local mappers, including youth, and uh, we promote open street map and the use of uh, geospatial uh, data. And we then advocate for supporting database decision making. And together we uh, mapped uh, 27 districts in Mongolia. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the brief overview of uh, where we mostly map it and uh, or where we mostly unmap it. And the blue ping shows, indicates you, uh, indicates uh, we currently we are uh, partially mapped and the pink pin shows you the mostly unmapped. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, on, on, on this slide, uh, uh, we we have uh, organizing uh, over 20 uh, trainings and methodons and the top number of participants over uh, 250. And this work supported the national COVID-19 response agencies, local authorities, civil society organizations, and research and business. Next slide, please. Open street uh, map Mongolia community is largely uh, beginners and the young people, university students, local rural community members, and also GI sector uh, professionals. And uh, unfortunately, uh, at this moment, we have uh, not enough uh, validators in, in Open street map, and uh, we will be. Uh, uh, organize more training on uh, validators. On the data collection, we have used, uh, organized the crowdsourcing uh, uh, data collection by ArcGIS Online. And also we have organized field data collection of health services, uh, including pharmacies, hospitals, and uh, clinics and labs. And the uh, input into OpenStreetMap, all this collected data. And uh, also we are uh, willing to improve base map of uh, Ulaanbaatar in, on OpenStreetMap to, to organize uh, uh, Mapetown events with the local universities and the volunteers and GIS uh, uh, professionals. Next slide, please. Yeah, on this slide, uh, I, I would like to more uh, introduce you about how uh, we are going to distribute uh, health site data that we have collected during the uh, project time. And now we have uh, put uh, our uh, health site data into OpenStreetMap, and then we uh, uh, trying to build uh, web portal and uh, mobile applications. Uh, at this time, uh, we have already collected over 1,000 pharmacies and uh, 121 uh, state hospitals and uh, over 700 private hospitals in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, on the provincial uh, level, provincial health sites, we already have uh, uh, 860 clinics and hospitals and uh, almost 800 uh, uh, pharmacies in province, province, provincial level. And uh, people can have access all this data through our uh, uh, health site portal and uh, uh, mobile application. And uh, people can have find their uh, nearest uh, Head sites. Uh, okay, thank you. Great, thank you for sharing that and for sharing how people access this information for the very first time um, and were able to do so in a free and digital way. 
Um, so we're now going to hear from Paula Arujo um, to share how the Gao School in Peru helped public offici officials at all levels of government to ensure that vulnerability data existed and was used for critical decisions. Over to you, Paula. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, first. My name is Paola Araujo, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to share with you one of our experience we had in Gal Center last year using digital mapping and questionnaires responding to the COVID crisis. Our vision in Gal Center is to make lifelong learning engaging and productive with a positive social impact. And we were able to achieve this with this project. Let me explain. Um, the Cusco region of Peru poses particular challenges to public health workers and other government officials. With a dispersed population of over 1.4 million people living in rural areas ranging from the jungle in the north and northeast of our region to highland areas well over 4,000 meters about sea level in the south of the region. This gives uh, shows a large mapping campaign we undertook in partnership with the Peruvian regional government in response to COVID-19 in Peru, Cusco region. Over a two-month period, over 10,000 volunteers from HOT mapped hundreds of thousands of buildings, including the complete road network. The orange clouds you can see are like a heat map where buildings were mapped and the blue lines represent roads. As the Peruvian government struggled to support its citizens, the most vulnerable population basically had to solve its own issues. Not only did they sometimes decide to close our roads, but also most government services stopped working completely in the rural districts. Incomplete maps can leave whole communities out of the picture when governments plan how to provide essential services. It certainly did this time around. Urban areas were prioritized and rural areas forgot. The existing government data from the last census held in 2017 maps people in rural areas only to the village level. When you have rural communities dispersed over many square kilometers of mountains or jungle, then this can cause a problem. It makes finding and reaching individual health call, let alone regularly visiting and tracing health indicators, extremely challenging. Our mapping initiative and response in Peru allowed new details down the individual household level. And we were able to put these people, these people literally on the map. Next slide, please. Thanks. Well, using the data from the digital map, dashboard were prototyped to enable to the regional government to locate population most at risk for COVID-19. These areas could then be prioritized to implement measures like hand washing stations to reduce transmission and delivering basket of food and basic goods to sustain the most vulnerable people through the COVID-19 quarantine. The data from the maps was also used to identify markets and other public areas that could potentially be places of cut transmission rates. On this map, you can see how we use data from COVID questionnaires to flag where oxygen was needed in Cusco. These patients have serious problems finding oxygen, and we not only coordinate the logistics with the, with, with the regional authorities, we also map and survey all the beneficiaries. Next slide, please. The data provided by the maps help deliver oxygen tanks to over 900 patients that come due to the existing hospital overflow in July and August 2020. Oxygen was delivered to non-hospitalized patients who were often stay for at home at the hospital within Cusco were overrun and people who were afraid of going to the hospital as they considered them place of extremely high risk. The mapping and monitoring of our project includes data covering the patients and their caregivers, their locations, and the specialized drop off and collection points across the city were taking care of the health center. Well, we are so proud to be the local health partner and are grateful for the financial and technical support. We were able to save lives, assist authorities, and bring hope to many people thanks to HOT, and we are grateful for that. Um, that's all for me. Please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that great work, Paula. 
We're now going to move on to the private sector and hear about how they supported this problem. Um, so let's hear from Megan Danielson, the Community Programme Manager from Mapbox. That team supports the use of Mapbox's tools for social impact, um, especially in response to the pandemic. Great. Thank you, Carly. Um, and thank you all for being here today. It's really wonderful to see how our global community has stepped up to use geospatial data to help tackle issues related to COVID-19. Um, I'm here representing Mapbox. For those of you who don't know what Mapbox is, we're a live location data platform for mobile and web applications. And that is to say that we create APIs and SDKs that enable you to bring location data into your mobile and web solutions. Next slide. As Carly said, I'm on the community team at Mapbox and uh, we are really the port of call at Mapbox for nonprofits, NGOs, educational institutions, and anyone else who wants to use our tools for a positive impact. Next slide. And throughout the pandemic, we've seen many organizations from nonprofits to government agencies use geospatial tools to tackle issues related to COVID-19. At last count, we've spotted over 300 COVID-related solutions that leverage Mapbox tools. And we've directly supported, and by that I mean we've provided resources such as discounts, technical support, and even design reviews for over 140 of these organizations and still counting. Um, these solutions have included things like uh, national vaccine locators uh, to help individuals find vaccines and available appointments near them. This is the US National Vaccine Finder, uh, vaccine.gov. They've also helped to enable people to create dashboards, such as the one that you're seeing here from UN OCHA. This dashboard enables users to examine the impact of COVID-19 in countries with active humanitarian operations. Next slide. As well as we've helped uh, see maps that track genomic variations and transmissions of the virus, like this one from NextStream. And lastly, we've also seen dashboards and tools to help people understand the very real impact uh, this pandemic has had on our economy. So really the, the types of projects that we've been working on uh, span a very wide spectrum. In addition to supporting our external partners to use our tools uh, to help meet the moment, we've also been focusing on how we can use our tools internally um, to tackle issues of accessibility. And by that, I mean access to healthcare facilities and equitable access to vaccines. And you'll see that I have an asterisk up here on this slide for accessibility because accessibility is a very broad topic. Um, and I'm happy to hear how other people think about accessibility. Please contact me at the end of this um, if you wanna continue talking about it. But uh, really what we were looking at is accessibility in terms of what people can reach, what resources you can reach within a given time frame. Next slide. The project that I'd like to highlight with you today is our work with the GYM initiative to examine vaccine access, to use our tools to examine vaccine access in South Sudan. Next slide. To support this pilot program, our team used our navigation tools and mainly our isochrone API, which you're seeing as a visualization here, to examine accessibility to healthcare facilities as these are potential sites for vaccine distribution. So for this program, we were using healthcare facilities as a proxy for vaccine distribution sites. Next slide. Um, and we, again, we're just trying to think about accessibility within a given time frame. And one tool that we think is really great for tackling this question would be our isochrone API. This enables you to find out how far you can reach uh, or how far you can travel within a given time. And the isochrone API, this is our isochrone playground. And you can see kind of the parameters that you can tweak and the output that you would receive after you, have, after you use a request. So some of the parameters that you can manipulate would be things like the modality of movement. So are we looking about at accessibility in terms of walking or are we looking at it in terms of drive time? You can define the length of time that you are traveling. So is this uh, 15 minutes? Is that considered accessibility 30 or even 120 minutes, which is standard for most public health analyses. Um, you can have the output adhere directly to the road network itself, like you see here, or you can make it fuzzy. 
Um, and after you've decided on the parameters that you consider for your accessibility anal analysis, uh, you'll get this output either as a polygon or a polyline. So really shapes that define the area that you can reach within the given time frame. Next slide. And the data that powers our navigation tools, uh, as, such as our isochrone API, come from OSM, OpenStreetMap, and our telemetry data. So Mapbox consumes OpenStreetMap data daily. Every edit undergoes a review process by our data raid team. And then that data is used to create our road classifications and our road segments. Um, it's really great to have this living map uh, be the data behind our navigation APIs. In addition, we're constantly collecting anonymous mo mobile movement data, which helps us understand the traffic patterns within our road segments. Um, and this information is really useful when using something like the isochrone tool that I just showed you to determine travel time, because there's a really big difference between a 30 minute drive time with no traffic and a 30, what a 30 minute drive time is considered with heavy urban traffic, and that can really impact who has access to what and by, by those segments. Next slide. So the project in South Sudan, this is an example of what our model looked like, our Python script looked like. Um, and again, we were examining accessibility to healthcare facilities. And for this project, we were specifically looking at populations who were uh, had access to a healthcare facility within a 30 minute drive time. Some other parameters that you'll see up here are we put a four kilometer buffer around healthcare facilities. And that was just to ensure that if we had any road segments missing in our, in, in our data, that we were still capturing information around those healthcare facilities. Uh, after we uh, ran our isochrone APIs around every single healthcare facility, we also added another buffer of about one kilometer over the, the output of those polygons that we got. Um, and that was because we thought, well, you might be a 30 minute drive time from a healthcare facility, but you might additionally have an, at least another one kilometer walk. So we wanted to capture those people within our analysis. And all of these layers were unioned together to create our accessibility surface. And then uh, we extracted population data uh, from World Pop, which is a great resource if you're looking for fine resolution population data for the entire world. Um, and we extracted the population that was contained within our accessibility surface to figure out how many people, again, were within 30 minutes of any healthcare facility in South Sudan. Next slide. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so, this is kind of an example of our, this is an example of our results. Uh, the total population that we were looking at in South Sudan is about 11 million people. And we found that coverage of a 30 minute drive time plus this one kilometer buffer or the four kilometer buffer around our healthcare facilities yielded a population of se about 7.5 million people within our accessibility zone. So that's 67% of the population in South Sudan uh, are within a 30 minute drive time of the healthcare facilities that we were looking at. And again, I just wanna emphasize that every part of this model, the, the different parameters can be tweaked to meet the accessibility use case that you are actually working on. So if the drive time doesn't make sense for the population that you're looking for, because most people don't have an access to a car, then you can change it to a walk time or if 30 minutes is too short in terms of what we're considering accessibility, you can extend that drive time up to 120 minutes or more. Um, so all of these things can be mixed and matched to really suit the accessibility that you're trying to uh, look at or examine. Next slide. And we've used this kind of process for other examples. So this is another example of our isochrone API being used to look at access to schools in Kazakhstan. Next slide. And we've also used it to look at healthcare catchment sites in Mozambique. Next slide. Uh, this is a really broad topic that we're just beginning to tackle. And we'd love to get your feedback on the various issues of accessibility that you think uh, that you're tackling and that you think that you could use tools like our isochrone API to continue investigating. And the best way to do that, to contact us, would be to email us at community at mapbox.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. So let's now hear more about how map data was used to improve vaccine equity, vaccine planning and access. Um, so we're going to hand over to Matt Berg, 
from Ona, which is a social enterprise creating software to support organizations to collect the right telling, collect the right telling and vital data, and then extract meaning from what they gather. Over to you, Matt. Great, thanks, Carly, very much. I'm just gonna take over the screen if that's okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of a, a, a let me, hopefully this works, I'm doing live demos. Um, but I'm just gonna walk through just building off two key aspects. One is the fact like, you know, why is, how do we leverage the value of the OSM data and how, having the importance of having accurate data, especially in rural areas, why that's so key. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about measuring access, building off of what Megan just spoke about in our, in our collaboration with Mapbox and using the Isochrone API. Um, so as an organization, you know, we've been focused a lot on, on this idea of, of service delivery uh, around the idea of micro planning. And micro planning in a, in a basic level is, you know, how do you provide developed strategies for um, reaching um, everybody for a specific service? Typically, this can be around immunization services. So in the context of COVID-19, it's how do we make sure that we get COVID vaccines out to everybody um, basically in the country? that's eligible. And then um, the more common use case in a non-pandemic context is uh, routine immunization programs. Um, there's this idea of kind of reach every district that UNICEF and WHO have developed as a methodology. Um, and the basic idea there is you wanna develop strategies for reaching communities. Um, strategies could be facility-based. So as Megan just kind of mentioned, you know, what percentage of the population could reach a facility within say 30 minutes? Um, or it can be more of an outreach-based approach. So there's some areas that are considered hard to reach. So we're gonna have to come up with mobile strategies or other strategies, uh, or those communities will basically not have access. And that explains a lot of why, like if global immunization rates are stuck at 80% in a lot of places, they haven't really moved. Um, so I think better planning will be key to, to, to bringing down that level. Um, so just gonna walk you through a couple of different methodologies for how we're using um, thinking about this. So the most standard approach that's used um, is a distance-based approach for measuring access. So this map here, um, if you can see, we have, I'm, I just picked a, a district. So we're working with UNICEF and the MOH in Mozambique um, to assess um, for both the immunis uh, for routine immunizations where this work is coming out of. Um, so we have a district called Morumbula. Um, and you have the district boundaries, you have the, the, the facilities are here, and then you have the communities. So that's sort of like your demand and your source of supply. Uh, the other thing we could also see is population. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting, so what I've done here is I've just created a, a gridded or basically a, a hex map of population densities. But what's underlying this data, um, this population, is what we call these kind of um, high resolution population maps. This one's coming from GRID3. Um, there's also World Pop and Facebook is also now releasing incredible maps in this space. And what this is, is doing is it's leveraging advances in, sorry, um, in machine learning and uh, accessibility of high, res high resolution satellite imagery, local census data to develop detailed population maps. And each of these pixels basically represents a, a certain number of people. Um, so for the first time, we can start to develop um, maps that provide us really pretty accurate and pretty detailed sense of where people live uh, in a location. Um, so what we do with that is we can then come up with these buffers. So, you know, the, the, we, we do these kind of circles. So I'm just going to remove this for clarity. Um, this is a three kilometer buffer. This is as a crow flies, you know, eight kilometers, which is sort of like the, this is a typical thing that's used for, for measurement in terms of time access. So you can already see there's a lot of, of, of communities that are being missed. Um, also, you can see that there's a lot of population densities that are also being missed with eight kilometers. And we could extend this out to, to, to broader buffers um, to get analysis. And then using this, you could also develop these curves of what percentage of the population are covered within each distance. So I can see that 50% are co copied with are covered within five kilometers and it goes up to, to uh, sorry, 43% is at six kilometers. Uh, we're only at 35% of five kilometers. We could also calculate the absolute numbers of the populations too. Um, so this is sort of the standard approach that most countries use because it doesn't require access to good data. It just knows you need to know the locations of communities and you need to, need to know where your facilities are. A more uh, 
um, kind of probably the gold standard is a tool called Access Mod that WHO, UNICEF, and the University of Geneva have developed. And what this does is this it takes accounts, you know, um, things like barriers, like waterways, roads, et cetera. And then, you know, we can then use the same calculations, but then do an isochrone approach um, using their model to start to, to see this is the area that can be reached within 30 minutes, that can be reached within 60 minutes, that can be reached within 90 minutes, et cetera, okay? And what's really powerful about Access Mod is they, they like, these are, you know, been really refined and they have a lot of ability to tweak and tune the kind of model. Um, one of the challenges with it is that it, though we've had to import all this data. So we had to manually import this from OSM. So these are all OSM data, like the waterways, um, the, the roads, and et cetera. You can also start to see that the quality of, of the data is really key. So like for some reason, it kind of drops off here. I don't know if the roads really drop off here or this hasn't been mapped properly in OSM. So you can start to see where your models of isochrones might be. Um, so that's one of the problems with this methodology is it depends on good quality data too. So just kind of flagging that. Um, so anyway, so but with this approach, we have to import all this data. So one of the really nice things about um, working with um, um, the API that Map, Mapbox provides that's built on top of OSM data is we can do the same type of analysis where all the roads are already imported and they're being updated in real time as, as edits are made to OSM. Uh, we can do, sorry, we can do nationwide analysis really quickly, right? So here's an example where we've done a 30 minute analysis, very similar to what, what Mapbox did in, in South Sudan, but for all of Mozambique, right? And what's really cool about the isochrones too, is you can kind of see like we have an area here where, you know, we have these roads, we have like, you know, islands and, and waterways, and you, you're not just jumping across like here, you know, you're not jumping, th this population has a harder ability to access this population here because of the water, right? So it takes accounts for that. The buffer approach would not. Um, so what we can do with this is we can develop these things, which, you know, visually is very helpful. Um, and then, you know, we could also do it for, for different times. So depending on the model, you want to use, as, as Megan kind of mentioned, it's kind of ability to, to tweak that, which is very powerful. But then what's exciting is we can then take this and then we can do analysis, right? So, you know, by saying, what's the populations that are covered in these areas, in these areas, what are the populations that fit outside? Um, we can then start to develop these maps. So this is a map showing the, the, the coverage or the number of people that are covered in each catchment. Now we've used a methodology called a Voronoi, which is a geospatial kind of division. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily represent exactly who the facility serves, but it's just a way of equally dividing up the area so you don't double count. But it does provide you a pretty good overview of what access looks like. And um, so you can see that there's some, there's some areas where, you know, there's a lot of, where some facilities are covering a lot of people. But more importantly, we have the ability to see where gaps in coverage are too, right? So in the cities, like in, in Bira, we can see that, you know, if we, if we add on top the travel areas, that, you know, 99% of the population is covered, you know, in these areas, right? Um, but if we zoom out, there's some areas of the country where only, you know, 5% of the population is covered, right? So this kind of planning that combines the high res resolution satellite imagery, isochronic APIs, we can do very quickly and at scale, and I think provide some information that's I think kind of quite new in terms of what groups can do. So I don't know if there's a, a game park here. I kind of want to zoom in and look at it, but it kind of gives you a pretty high level view of what's needed for, for planning. We could also then take this data, put it into tables and you can start to quantify what access looks like in terms of coverage, et cetera. Um, the last bit is we then convert this to uh, micro plans. So this way we can do also is develop these detailed maps at the community level. Um, so we can, all this is data from OSM, um, but then we could add in, for example, the coverage areas, we could highlight the areas of people that, um, the communities that, sorry, are, um, you know, red that are outside of the health facilities, or the green are inside. We could add in the locations of the, um, of CHW, so community health workers, and we can start to see the, the areas that are covered, you know, by both of those areas. But then we could also show this in corresponding tables. So if you want to see all the communities that don't have health facility coverage, we have a list here, we have their populations. And then we worked on tools that integrate this into like a spreadsheet. So you can use this 
like a spreadsheet planning tool for your planning purposes. Um, so this is how that kind of higher level planning can be trickled down to the lower level. Um, and then we can we can use this analysis and these tools, you know, at, you know, kind of national scale. Um, and that's kind of where the power of, of all this kind of comes in. So you can kind of go from macro to micro, um, you know, really quickly. I just want to give one other last example, if I have time, very briefly, is that there's a drought in Angola right now. Um, that's the worst one in 40 years. Um, so what the government is doing is they're having to pipe water. Um, um, so they're having to truck water to different locations, right? Um, and they're, so we're working with UNICEF on some ways to try to improve the accountability. So some of the, the trucks aren't being delivered where they're supposed to. So communities are complaining about not having water. And fuel is a huge driver of cost. So they're also wanting to come up with better methods for, for saying, like, you know, we gave this driver you know, the driver's asking for this much money, what is the actual driving distance to get to these communities? So, so the, more, the, mod, the money is a factor of how many communities they can serve to some extent too. Um, so one of the things we're exploring is using uh, map boxes. So Megan, we got to chat after this. Directions API um, to look at ways to, um, to, to basically calculate the distances um, from, you know, from traveling to point A to, to communities that are represented in point B. Um, and again, this leverages the, I believe, probably mostly OSM data. Um, so, um, but I don't know how accurate the road coverage is in these areas. So this is the exact example. If you're ever thinking about why hot, you know, cause to action and they map an area, it's for exactly for a reason like this, where you say, hey, we have this problem, but we need to have really accurate road quality data so we can come up with planning to get to these communities. That kind of provides it. And then layering on top the algorithms that Mapbox have have been able to develop becomes a really powerful combo um, for planning purposes. And then groups like us just try and facilitate and make it a little bit easier with some web tools and some support um, and kind of hold the hands of organizations to make that kind of planning possible. Um, so I think this is a really powerful example of, of another use case using APIs that um, provide logic on top of, of OSM data, which is this living map. Um, so I'll wrap up there, but you know, thank you. Um, and again, I'm with Ona. Um, we're a company, um, US and Kenyan company. So it's, most of our team is Kenya that does this work. Um, and if you're interested in, um, you know, reach out, please reach out to me, send me an email or reach out to us on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to work with you. And the, everything I showed you is based on a web tool, Kuko, that we're using for supporting, um, you know, planning or data visualization, data storytelling, mapping, et cetera. Um, so I'll wrap up there and thanks for your time. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Matt. Um, so we have a few questions that have come through um, from the audience. So I'm going to share those now. And if you've got any questions, please do put them in the Q&A tab. Um, and if you're in the room as well, um, please raise your hand and hopefully someone can share a microphone. Um, so the first question we have here is around um, COVID litter. Um, so the question is, do we have any data about how the massive increase in COVID litter is increasing the risk of community transmission of the virus? Um, so I think I can take that one. Um, we only work with existing data that were shared with us by partners at the moment. Um, and our focus in this work has mainly been to visualize the information into map products so that citizens have the needed information. Um, it's not as ex extensive as risk mitigation at the moment. Um, there is a global community of people all working on creating and using OSM data, though. Um, so please do share on the hot talk list. Um, thousands of people are there who can share um, if this has been a topic that they've looked at and can share learnings as well. Um, so the next, the next question is around um, aerial imagery. Um, so it's from Dennis and it says, were you mostly able to rely on aerial imagery or did recorded GPS tracks play any role? Are there any semi-automatic tools that use image recognition to support the mapping work by generating candidate objects for review or adjustment? Um, so I'm gonna hand that one over to Carter Draper, if that's okay with you, Carter. Sure, sure, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks for the question. Yeah, this is quite an interesting question. And uh, this is one of the, value added um, impact for building OSM communities across across different um, local communities and towns. 
So yes, we had like a combination of all of that. We, the data that was shared with us contained um, coordinates, but then uh, we experienced that some of those coordinates were kind of way off uh, the facilities. And so the imagery play a larger role in enabling us to visualize, you know, um, the foot, building footprints and able to identify um, the health facilities also. But more beyond that, um, the contributors, the volunteers that work on the project, these are people that also originated from those districts, from those towns, from those counties. And so they were also able to kind of use their local knowledge to be able to properly identify those features and kind of realign them. So yes, uh, the imagery play a part, um, the data from the partners play a part, and of course, um, the local knowledge from our partners or from our volunteers play also a larger part in aligning those uh, coordinates and identifying those features. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Carter. Um, we have another question here about engaging rural populations. So how can we make sure that rural communities aren't left behind? Are we involving them in the process? Um, so I'm gonna hand that one over to Paula, if that's okay with you, as I believe the work in uh, Peru did involve um, some locations. Yes, thank you, Carly. Can you repeat my please the question? I can hear well. Yeah, sure. Um, so are we engaging rural members in our work so that we make sure that rural communities are not left behind? So maybe you can share in Peru, um, were there rural locations that were mapped? Um, was the community involved in the process? And if so, how? Please, Carly, I, it's, I can hear well. No problem. Um, can anyone else, can you hear me okay? Uh, other presenters on, on here? Yeah, sure. Um, you you talk about the rural communities, Carly? Yeah, um, yeah, in Peru, um, were there rural communities involved um, in your project? We work with, okay, I think I can hear. We work with the with the city of instead of the Cusco, like San Sebastian, San Jerónimo, Santiago. We map all the rural communities in these districts, and we can work with all the vulnerable population in these districts. Okay, it's okay. Brilliant. Yes, thank you, Paula. Um, and indeed, in all of our work, um, if it's a rural location that's being mapped, um, it's absolutely possible. Um, and we also have kind of tools and technology that work offline um, and in low resource settings as well um, to do the local mapping element of this work. Um, so I can't see any more questions in the chat. Um, if anyone in the room has a question, please do, please do share that now. Not seeing any movement, but I can see we have around 130 people online. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're towards the end of our session here. So um, on behalf of all the speakers, a big thank you for joining us. Um, we would love to keep this, on, this conversation going. Um, the existence of data, especially open geo data, is an ongoing problem. It's something we believe we can all solve uh, by working together. If you'd like to hear more about the geographic information management um, initiative, please do get in touch. Um, we're also really interested in data partnerships. Um, you can get involved as an individual contributor as well. Um, so please do reach out to any of the speakers um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much.